Yeah, it, it hey everybody, welcome to Palmetto Cats, where we unwrap the anglers of YouTube, and we have a super, super special guest, Mr. Tim, aka Doc Lang. Welcome, Doc. How are you doing? Thank you, Kevin. I'm doing great. I'm here in Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> and Ohio and yeah, and I'm ready uh, to freeze to death. <laughs> <It's cold here. laughs> yeah, Doc and I were talking that he's been getting acclimated to that Alabama heat, and yeah. he comes back to Ohio to visit the grandkids and the kids and everything, and you're getting spoiled, huh? Yeah, it's 75 degrees and then drops down into 60s at night. So it's uh, <laughs> yeah. I went to the football games this weekend, and man, I, I was sitting out there shivering. <laughs> and you got a whole mess of grandchildren in the background, right? Yeah, yeah, you can hear them back there. So don't He's, you said twenty-two people? Yeah, yeah. There's about twenty-two people or so back. Goodness there. gracious, the that's bunch. man. That's the best time, man, with family. You can't, yeah. you can't replace that. Yeah, we. So, hey, S. Smith. Yes, sir. We spent all day I, today on the uh, uh, Mad River uh, on kayaks and canoes. So, just enjoying fact, we, each other. Yeah, Look. we just come off of the water about two hours ago. <laughs> no fishing today, just just uh, kayaking yeah. and enjoying the weather, huh? No, yeah, I've been just hanging with the grandkids. I'm going to go tomorrow and watch my granddaughter play uh, softball. So, oh, okay. Yeah, before I head back home. Awesome. So. Uh, hey, S. Smith, Mike Irvin, we got Matthew Baker in here, uh, Charlie Hubbard. My wife, Anna, we got Betty Jean Cross, Buckeye Fish, and Mike Sampson. Uh, Lyle from Catfish Weekly. Uh, you you know that guy? Yeah. You know that guy, Doc? I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Talked to him, uh, I think, a week or so ago. Yeah? You know, it just my phone doesn't work the greatest. The best time it works is when I'm out on the water. So, you know, I can, get a signal. Yeah. <laughs> I can get a signal out there, but uh, at the house, no, it's tough. Well, hey, we already got a question, so let's get right to it. I was going right. to ask you some questions about Skipjack. Uh, we don't have Skipjack down here, but uh, Steven Steele, a friend of mine, he says, on a hot day, what's your go-to bait on a cold day? Uh, do you go with something else? Well, uh, down here, mainly the skipjack is the bait of choice. But because I'm a northern guy by heart, uh, I like shad. So I, you know, I have both in the boat at all times. I, you know, I, I have with they have yellow tails, they have gizzard shad down here, and then we have the skipjack. And I always put out, you know, one of each if I, I if I get lucky and get the gizzard and the yellow tails. So, but, uh, and there's always a big skipjack head on, on one of the poles. So got to have that skipjack head, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You talked about finding a skipjack with side image and you want to tell us about that? Yeah, it was something that I, I was kind of playing around with. And, uh, what was happening is after I got down here, I couldn't find the skipjacks below the dam. They just weren't there. So I went back into mm -hmm. a Creek. And I started hunting around for that, and I was using side image. And then all of a sudden, I noticed these, they looked like on side image, most of the time when you mark a fish on side image, it's just a dot. That's all you see is a, a, a small dot. A bigger fish, you know, you'll see a dot and then a shadow right there. But skipjack on side image show up as pencil marks. So you see a streak. Instead of a dot, you see a line. It looks like somebody's taken a pencil and hit it about four or five times on the side scan. So, you know, I, 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 I want, when I looked at it, I said, I wonder what that is. So I started throwing some jigs out. All of a sudden, man, I'm, I'm bringing in skipjack. I, oh, boy, <laughs> here we go. So now when I get below the dam, that's the very first thing I do. I flip to the side scan. I start looking around, trying to find, you know, the schools of the skipjack. And then I go above them and then I go old school and start looking for that current seam and then drop the anchor and then, uh, you know, ease back. And then I don't throw jigs. Uh, I put okay. them below agitators or they call them popping floats. 
and just drop them out the back of the boat and then let them go back. Cause I, you know, I already know how many feet I am from those skipjacks from looking at my little rants. Right. And then I just let that trail back to that area and I stagger the two that way they don't run into each other because boy, that's a mess when they, they, you know, the two of them get tangled together. I tie my own jigs, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's interesting information. Now, do you think that like other bait fish would show up like that on the side scan or I do you think it's just something to they, for skip? They will show up, but the, you'll, there'll be a whole bunch of dots. Be a dots. I, I really think the reason they show us streaks is because those skipjacks are moving so fast that, you know, instead of being painted as a dot, it's painted as a streak. Gotcha. So, Everybody likes your hat. I O. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ohio State. <laughs> hey, Zach Murray, fishing with JBT, Maurice Kaysen, Skip Stewart, Catfish and Crappy. Hey, Mark. Uh, Andrew Wilson, welcome. Have you ever used shrimp for bait? Uh, yeah, when I fished here in Ohio. Now, I've not used it in Alabama. Okay. Um, set shrimp is really good up in Sandusky Bay. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah right. we use it. We use it down here, but you mainly get those small, you small know, channel shrimp. cats and blue cats. <coughs> yeah. Actually, actually, you get a bunch of, um, everything else pecking on it. Uh, bluegill. Yeah. Um, I mean, everything wants a piece of it. <laughs> Uh, and it doesn't really stay on the hook as well. Uh, setting hooks and crossing eyes. All right, Doc. Flatheads. <laughs> when river is really low with barely any current, almost stagnant, where do you look? I always look at structure. I am a structure fisherman. Uh, kind of. It's kind of strange here in Alabama because I, uh, you know, I like to chase uh, flatheads. I still continue to chase them here in Alabama. The thing of it is, uh, the flatheads relate a little bit different than their no northern counterparts you know down here yeah. i started i'd see a tree down i'd see a fish mark anchor up and it pulls a blue and it, it just had me befuddled why the flatheads don't relate to trees down here the flatheads relate to rocks uh, i had my daughter with me uh she came down for a visit you know, we were in about 36 foot of water and I told her, I said, I'd like to get you on a flathead because she'd never caught a flathead. And sure enough, I found this rock. I rolled around, you know, marked him. I said, that that is a good fish right there. And it ended up being a flathead. So all the flatheads I've caught mm -hmm. down here have all come off of rocks. None have come off of trees. But I, you know, I, I, it's about the same on Santee. Yeah, it's about the same. It doesn't matter maybe. where I go. I am I am really big on structure fishing. Yeah. Maybe it's a maybe it's a, a southern thing. These southern flatheads like the rocks. <laughs> I don't know. In our river system, we don't have a lot of down trees. Uh, you know, because I've watched I want to catch more flatheads. And actually my biggest flathead came because it was on the move. It was just, you know, it there was nothing out there. I was just fishing in a in a ditch. And it just, I guess it passed by my bait and hit. Um, so I've been trying to learn how to catch them more. And, uh, you know, we don't have those down trees anything, and stuff like that in our river. So, um, but on, up on Santee, you know, I've, I've, I've caught two or three in the rocks, just like you said, you know, yeah. fishing those rock piles. Um, let's see here. Um, cat fishing with Katie Collins. How you doing? I know I'm way behind on comments, y'all. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't want to cut off Mr. L Mr. Doc on anything he's saying because everything's going to be gold. <laughs> so if I don't get if I don't get to your comment, come back. Do flatheads go in the channel at night, Doc? Do they go in what's that again? They, do they go shallow in a channel at night? Here in Alabama? In Alabama? Uh, I guess it's just a general question. Okay, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll still go shallow up here. They, they go shallow in Ohio. They also go shallow uh, in Alabama. Mm -hmm. You know, we caught some, you know, up by the dam. Uh, where I fish mainly Wilson Lake. And uh, up by the dam, uh, it uh, it's only about 12, 14 foot deep. Mm. You know, lots of rocks, lots of wood, ton of wood up there. 
So there's Chris Souders. Uh, where Larry's gonna be fishing with Chris Souders here, your son Larry. Yeah. <laughs> so hey, Chris, welcome to the show, Doc. What's uh one place that you've you have been that you wish, sorry, that you've never been that you want to go one day? I would. Uh, let's see. I don't know. A couple of different places. One, I'd like to go out and fish out of California with Steve Johnson mm. uh, for the big channel cats out there. And I'd like to go fish with Chris Flores for those mm. ditch flatheads. Oh, never, wrong side. Uh, Muddy River catfish. Yeah, <laughs> I've never done that. And then it just sounds cool to, you know, cool place to be. Now that I'm acclimated to the heat, you know. It doesn't yeah. <laughs> so you want to get in one of those float tubes and float down the water with him? <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Did you see his latest video? No, uh -uh. he um, so he he was fishing with a, a guy who won a trip with him, I guess. And uh, he his leader broke off. Chris finally hooked up to one, his leader broke off, and then um, another one came off the hook. And so the third one he hooked, but it went into some uh, some structure or trees or whatever. Chris said, I'm not losing another one. And he jumped off the tube and went down in the water <laughs> and got it untangled. <laughs> oh, now, he didn't say that, but I picked on him. I said, yeah, you didn't want to be showing up for a third time. By, <laughs> by That's a noodling. He'd rather, he'd rather get in the water than. <laughs> hey, so um, used to be in pharmaceuticals. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I retired yeah. from uh, pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I was in it for 17 years. Awesome. So you're the mechanic that uh, kind of a jack of all trades, a licensed electrician, li uh, wow. like welder, uh, you know, and I worked on the machines that make the pills and the capsules that people have to take, uh, you know, heart medications. Uh, we were big on uh, stuff for cystic fibrosis for children. Oh, so they they package a lot of that kind of stuff. So I took care of all the equipment and the machinery that did that kind of stuff. So I wow, retired, retired on, you know, on my birthday on in 2019 after 17 years with them. Wow. So. <laughs> well, congratulations. And I know you've been fishing every minute since. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, ever since I uh, moved to Alabama, it's been a five day of a week uh, Monday bit. through Friday, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I got another. Just went from uh, a job uh, that was paying a bunch of money to a job that just pays a whole bunch of memories. There you go. <laughs> uh, what's the best way for an older dog that is only used to old school techniques to try uh, to modernize a little and learn to use new technology? Well, that's uh, <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, because I'm an old dog. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, ha I had to go through that. You just got to force yourself to, uh, you know, get in there and go. Uh, you know, electronics is I'm big on electronics. I'm more so on mapping now, uh, especially down here on Wilson Lake, which is just a, a forest of trees under the water. So my mapping is very, very critical as to whether I'm going to catch fish or I'm going to drown hardware all day. So are they are they upright trees like Santee or are they all down trees? No, they're awesome. they're standing. Some of them are standing. Some of them are laid down, but most of them are standing. Mm. And one of my it's, favorite methods of fishing is dragging. But right, you know, it, it's it's tough to drag through these trees. So, so is it dangerous? Like on like on Santee, is it dangerous really to to run through there? No, huh? No, huh? Oh, okay. So they're cut well below the surface. Some of them are. I, I caught one the other day that I was in 55 foot of water and I saw the tip top of the tree. Oof, the, see, that's dangerous out, to me. <laughs> sticking out of the water. It was only like a little limb sticking out. But, you know, my planer board went right over top of it and I went, oh, no. And then, you know, I went over there and there – you know, it looks like when you see it on the down scan, it looks like a Christmas tree. Yeah. Ornaments hanging off of it. And you know, <laughs> I'm pulling up trot lines all the time. I, I actually, last week, I pulled up a trot line that had a glass Mountain Dew bottle attached to it. 
So that thing had been around for a long time. And it hadn't broken in all those years. It hadn't broken. So I got it. I'm, I'm not going I'm not about to open it up because it's no telling what, <laughs> thing. but you know, I, it's out in the garage. So, but Hey Rex I, blocker. Hey, fishing with the Chad, Betty Jean cross, uh, uh, half crazy cat fishing, chunky cats. Just want to shout out a few that I saw here. Um, you, you talked about in, in one of your, I forget where I saw it, maybe catfish conference. You talked about cormorant feces, cormorant poo, and how, um, you know, it related to catfishing. Can you talk about that a little bit? I thought that was very interesting. Those guys, their diet is strictly fish. So, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever noticed it when Corman's roost, uh, if they're roosting in a tree, if the tree is live within, you know, a couple of years, that tree is dead. The foliage is off of it only because when those guys poo all over it, it, it just rips it apart. But what happened and I, and I found it here in Ohio that if I see them up in the trees, uh, there's catfish underneath of it because that, that that's just pure shad that's coming out of those guys. And uh, the fish are, you know, that they'll be right in there. So if you can drift a bait down, you know, across those or throw something in there, you'll catch fish. You said something about like the protein and the catfish eat it because it's yeah. protein. Yeah, because of that was the, I never heard that before. It's all shad, you know, it's all shad yeah. protein. You know, the, all they are is fish eaters. And we got I never a, ever thought about it. There's a ton <laughs> of them in Alabama. That's, you know, that's the other thing when I'm looking for the skipjacks. I keep an eye on where those cormorants are at. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always afraid I'm going to hook one of them, but uh, they're always where the bait fish are at. So I keep an eye on where they pop up and, you know, how far they they swim in the current to uh, find the shad and stuff like that, you know, that I'm looking for. And you said that um, skipjack are cannibals, right? Yeah. Yeah, right now um, – on a below Wheeler Dam, uh, we've got skipjacks that are about three to four inches long, and uh, the t the the twenty inch, the eighteen twenty inch skip skipjacks are coming up, and and they're killing those. They're eating hmm. them because when I catch them, you know, I'll get I'll look at the deck of the boat, and and they'll have two or three of them in their mouth, and they're wow, know, they're they're eating their own kind. We don't have skipjack, but we have river shad. And I've often wondered the same thing since I heard you say that, you know, are, are all, um, I'm sorry, river herring is what I meant. Um, I, I've always wondered if, if they're, they do the same thing. Yeah. They just, they, you know, they just look like a mini tarpon is what they look like. Right. You know, so, uh, you know, they were on, they were out in the ocean, uh, and, uh, he, you know, they just, uh, they were out in the ocean and then they acclimated to fresh water. They right. came to salt water and acclimated to fresh water, moved up the river systems. And, you know, now we've got them all in the river system. Uh, Ace Catfish and Ann Half Crazy both asked, what does it mean when a catfish is still full of eggs in September? Boy, I don't know. Other than, you know. Maybe they didn't get a drop them. I have no idea. I've never seen that. Yeah. Uh, wow. that catfish Head no Hunter says late spawn. Not all catfish spawn at the same time. I guess no, that's, that's a good. True. That's very true. That's a good. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So um, have you ever heard of a Roshad? Roshad. Nope. So, so we have, uh, you know, like regular gizzard shad down here in Santee and, and there's a bait shop Hills landing. They, they usually sell a bunch of them. Um, and you know, you'll have a, a, a bunch of bait guys around here selling them by the dozen. Um, but I went into the shop the other day and they had row shad and they're about 14 inches long. And I said, is this, is this a gizzard shad? And she said, no, it's a row shad. She said something about they harvest the eggs from them and then they they sell them for bait. Oh wow! I wonder if I wonder if they are gizzard shad. They're just the ones with eggs in them, maybe. 
could be. No, nobody's <laughs> ever heard of them down here. Yeah. So. Depending on how many, you know, where you get them at, everybody always has a different name for them. That's true. <laughs> Tell us about the Kirby rig and how you use it uh, to catch skipjack. <laughs> yeah, that that's kind of little unique thing there. Uh, you know, I teased Joey about he showed me that Kirby, and I, actually I was the one that named it for him. But yeah. I said, oh, well, I'm going to call this a Kirby rig because – it's I a saltwater it, rig, though, right? Yeah, it's a trout. Yeah, we have them down trout. here. Probably <laughs> what it is. So what I do is uh, I'll put one of those right below my swivel and then put the j my jigs that I make behind it and then drop it down back behind the boat and let it float. And then uh, on the other rod, I have what is known as an agitator. You know, it looks like a hollowed out ice cream cone. It makes noise when you pop it, and uh, that'll be the second rod. Generally, I can't put more than two rods out. Most of the time, I can only put one out to keep up with everything, especially if I get on that, that seam line that they are actively feeding on it. So, you know, uh, last week I went out there. I wanted to get, you know, I, I, try, I don't try to overdo my resources. Um you know, I don't want to load up on a bunch of skipjack uh, for one day's fishing. You know, so I go out on like Monday and I try to catch. Generally, I go out in the evenings and try to catch them because uh, it's it's just peaceful and there's not a lot of people out there. And uh, I'll, I'll try to get 20 skipjacks and uh, that's what I fish the next day. Well, here lately... 20 skipjacks has not been enough because uh wow really like i yeah i told one of the guys <laughs> he said well how, how are you doing with fishing i said well uh i'm catching more fish than the dot has traffic barrel that's what you sent right me the now. other day <laughs> yeah yeah so you know and, and you know none of, they're not monsters but I right just, you know that's that's what i'm on the water to do is just to catch fish i just i want to catch fish i don't care how big they are if i get lucky and you know i, I think it was last week uh i ended up with i think a 40 pounder it was the first day uh and uh you know outside of that all the rest of them was 20 and 30 pounders but you know those are good fish 20 and 30 pounds <laughs> I'll, is good. I'll take 20 and 30 pounders all day i'll take hey, yeah man as long as they're yanking rods down, I, I'm a happy. I'm a happy camper. You know what they say those those teenage fish, those twenty and thirty pounders, are the hardest fighters. Oh yeah. Well, down here, you, you can't go by how hard a fish pulls a rod down. And no? anyway, I mean that, the little five pounders. You think that their grandparents are on the end of the line. You know, you think <laughs> they slam 40, it, huh? <laughs> yeah, you think there's a 40 or a 50 pounder. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty exciting. Uh, so. Chris Souders asked, rattles or no rattles? What's your thoughts? I think I know the question. The answer yeah, is, I've go always, ahead. I've always got the rattles. I've always got either the spinning rattles or the, the old demon dragons, mm -hmm. those kind of stuff. Uh, I, I like the, I like the noisemakers. Um, you know, uh, when Chris and did I, I see you, Herka? Didn't you? Don't you put a hook on a demon dragon? Yeah, yeah. For channel cats, I'll put the a hook on a uh, with a quick clip on the belly of a demon dragon, and then I'll run the the uh, leader line through the dra demon dragon and run a hook on the back side. But last year, uh, when Chris and I went to Mississippi river and fished um uh, we were running demon dragons and man if you ran if you didn't run a demon dragon we didn't get bit but if really you something that made noise we were getting bit so you know wow. i mean we, we went the the one day we went chris caught i caught a 65 pounder which is the best that's the biggest one i've ever caught back bouncing and then Chris followed right behind me the next day with a 55 pounder. And, uh, 
you know, we were having a little contest with each other, you know. So <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun. Man. Everybody's going to to the yeah. website and they're buying Demon Dragons right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I like I like them, and you know, I you know, when uh, Scott Manning had it, you know, he, he sponsored me, and I, I've got a lot of Demon Dragons, but I have left a lot of Demon Dragons too. Yeah. There's a lot of them down there that get stuck. Yeah, I've uh, I've there. had about. 20 of them in my lifetime so far and i don't have any left <laughs> yeah. so and they're I'm a little going, expensive so yeah and in two weeks when i'm on the mississippi river uh fishing there will be a demon dragon on my uh bouncing rod all the time there you go uh tim molina asks a uh, question for anyone how can you tell if a catfish is male or female me, I don't pay any attention to it. I just, you know, I just, okay. And, you know, it's a fish. Yeah. There's a lot of people say, well, that's a male. And, you know, the channel cats uh, here in Ohio is, you know, the, the channel cats in Ohio had, uh, uh, they've got big heads. The males have got big heads. The females are smaller. Yeah. That's what I always thought. They're raised They're on the blues too. Skins, you know, that kind of stuff. But, I don't really pay any attention whether mm -hmm. it's a male or a female. It's I think it's easier to tell um, right after they get off the bed because uh, the males will be all beat up and scrawny and have big heads at least down here. Um, yeah. But yeah, that is, I thought I always thought that the mouths were smaller. That that's how you told uh, told the difference on blue cats. But on the female, yeah, yeah, the females have the smaller mouths and the and the bigger, males. Are, uh, males got big nodules up on top. Yeah, Mm -hmm. stuff like that yeah. so. um so when you whenever you don't put a um a hook on the demon dragon do you run a line to one side and your leader out the other or do you run a line through the whole demon dragon i run a line through the three wires that are on the demon dragon that way i can adjust the demon dragon mm -hmm. to the size bait that i'm running does it ever like slip up on you or, or no, does it usually it, stay in place it's right there? You know, that's what's, that's what I liked about it. It just stays right there. I used to put O rings and stuff on it, but mm -hmm. you know, once you put a little bit of tension on there, it just locks it in place. Hmm. Okay. I have so to try that because I've always tied it to each end. Say yeah. that last part again. You can always move it up and down your leader line. You know, sometimes I use a, a leader line. that's only 24 inches long uh, and then sometimes I use one as, as long as three or four foot. So depending on how big a chunk of bait I'm using, you know, I may want that demon dragon real close to it. So it has a tendency of lifting it up higher, or I may want to go midway that way the bait kind of hangs down and then the dragon just, it'll pull right. It back up. Right. So I should say a float rather than a demon dragon, but. Well, I mean, it's the same thing, same principle. Hey, uh, fishing with a squirrel, how you doing? Mike Turner, Muskrat Adventures, uh, Duke City Anglers, how are y'all doing? We've got a question from Fishing with a Chad. Uh, will you be at the Rising Sun next weekend? No, unfortunately, my brother is coming in from Michigan, and he's come down, and he's going to spend a week fishing with me. So I will miss the Rising Sun Tournament. I fished it last year with Hugh and Rose Thompson. We had an absolute blast. We caught a lot of fish. We didn't catch the big fish that we needed game day. But, uh, you know, hey, it's fishing, and we were catching. <laughs> uh, I got another question from Chris. Uh, if you could pick one bait, one type of structure, and one depth of water. Man, he's making it difficult on you uh, to fish. For the rest of your life, what would those be? <laughs> uh, if you could only pick one bait, that would be a good one bait, one structure, and one depth of water. All right. Uh, I'd say gizzard shad, a tree down in the water, and about 30 to 35 foot. There you go, Chris. And I suppose that's for flatheads? Uh, flatheads or blues, either one. Yep. Uh, let's see. Normally, I don't carry the way, but okay. Just make sure I don't miss. Hey, Sean T. Outdoors, how you doing? Um, when you're dragging baits, do you ever drag 
big baits, like just big, like a big gizzard shad head or a big chunk of skipjack? Yeah, I uh, actually last week, the 40 pounder that I caught took a 20 inch skipjack, whole skipjack. Uh, I had whole, yeah, I, I'm fishing for big fish. So I put the whole skipjack out there. Wow. One of my favorite baits to put out are the little 12 to 14 inch skipjacks. And what I end up doing is I, I lay the skipjack on its side right behind its gill. I stick a knife in there and run it all the way to the tail and uh, separate it. And then that way, when it's being drug, it's sitting there going like this. Mm. You know, the, the, it's sitting there flapping. It's That's giving interesting. Away, yeah, it's giving away uh, scent the entire time, but it's giving me movement. Pro tip, pro tip. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I got two questions about hooks. So I'm going to put them into one. Uh, right. Let's see. Chunky Cat says, what's your favorite catfish hook? And then that goes with fishing with a squirrel. He said, offset circle hooks or inline circle hooks uh let's see my favorite one is the i uh, cannot think of it chris help me out it's the red one uh <laughs> um diachi well yeah diachi yeah diachi and uh i can't think of the number of it and the other one is the uh, dale tackles that 12 aught uh, circle hook that he's got. I like using that when I got really, really big baits to use. So, okay. Uh, Doc Lang, you take on environmental impact of leaving mono behind after breaking off a snag. It's bad. What's your What's your take? Yeah, yeah, it's it's bad. I wish there was something we could do about it, but you know, it's it's been like that forever and ever. Uh, mm. Over, you know. I, I don't get snagged up that much, and generally, I don't leave a lot of line. You know, my mono that I use, I'm using the slime line. Usually, it'll snap off, you know, near that hook, and I'll end up leaving that hook down there. Um, you know, I, th I think it's, you know, I can I, I know when I'm in, on Wilson Lake, there is so much mono in those trees, it's not funny. So yeah, I actually, I actually broke off, um, broke off on Friday and thankfully it, I was, I'm new, I'm new to bait casters. I've always used spinning reels and I, I drag a lot, a lot. And, you know, bait casters are just better for line management. Um, right. but breaking them off, I'm new at, uh, so I broke off like, and I was half spooled out and it broke closer to the boat than it did to the snag and uh luckily because i had a planer board on it i got to go back and pick up and i actually unsnagged everything i got the rig and all the mono back but you're not always that lucky yeah you know? i try not to break off if i can help mm -hmm. but, you know i'll go back and you know you right. got to reset and everything i'll go back and try to get as much of that most of the Me time too. i can generally get it undone especially if you can go the opposite way that you were dragging, you can pull right, it right out of there. Sometimes, and, and sometimes you got a fish on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But sometimes that structure just eats it up to the point where yeah. you just can't, you know. So, yeah. Most times, if I'm dragging and I'll see action on the tip of the pole, and then it'll just snag, I'll, I'll definitely go back and try to retrieve as much as I can. And most times, there's a fish on there, and it had taken it and gone under a tree or yeah you know, wrapped around something. So uh, I go back as much as I can, just like you said. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think the answer to that hook was D85. D85, yeah. And uh, Maurice, I think um, he it's said eight, mono or braid. That was mono, right? Mono. I, I always run mono, except when I'm uh, back bouncing on the Mississippi River and I run braid because I need that sensitive feel when yeah. I hit something on the bottom. Mm-hmm. So, um let's see hey one over outdoors how you doing john finn seeker tv how you doing um would you would that be dragging the tree or anchoring or and dropping baits well mm. i mainly drag through the trees um i am learning i i've got to and some you know whoever it was asked earlier how do you teach an old dog new tricks 
<laughs> so I met another retired guy that is on Lake Wilson. His name is Chris Fuller. And uh, he fishes vertical, but he never drags. So we are teaching each other how to do what we are really good at doing. So I'm teaching him to drag, and he is teaching me how to vertical fish those standing trees. So you know, it's just uh, we've only fished a couple of times, but, uh, you know, because I came back here to Ohio and did a bunch of other stuff, you know, and then I'm going to do some tournaments. But here in a couple of weeks, we'll be back together and we'll be fishing, you know, three or four days a week. Uh, chasing after the fish but uh yeah he's he's teaching me how to do it and he's got a kind of unique method to do it i'm not going to give mm -hmm. that out until oh, come on <laughs> so i learned to do it so <laughs> it, yeah it, it, it's quite uh we've got several different things we've sat down and talked about how mm -hmm. to get those fish out of those big trees my brother says i've cost our dad a fortune and lost fishing lures <laughs> I bet he has. My brother has a lot of things, but a lot of things, uh, great things, but he's not an angler. <laughs> hey, big sea, big country catfishing. Uh, Hagen Grubbs, how you doing? He says, hello, Doc. Hey, Hagen. Uh, uh, Stephen Corley, how you doing? Avid fisherman. I've seen a bunch of your names come in, but I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, let's see. Make sure. Uh, Mid-South Outdoor Life, how you doing? Awesome. Um, what day... What day are you getting here? My ditch, Doc, Mid-South Outdoor Life asks. I'll be there Wednesday. There you go. <laughs> All right. How much line do you let out when you're dragging, and does that ever change? Um, okay, so my setup is if I'm fishing by myself, I run four poles, right. uh, two that are dragging and two that are on planer boards. Um. The one that, and I'm using all Abu 7,000. The, the two draggers are 7,000 lever drags. Um, I drag one so far back behind it. It takes, uh, I've got half of the reel out. <laughs> to yeah. And it always has a head on it. And then the next, uh, the one that's dragging right beside it is a short drag. You know, it's not as near as far back there. The angle that it, that that bait is at on the boat helps you to get up and over top of those trees. Um, and then on the planer boards, you know, uh, I, ju I just take and I put bait on the planter boards and then I throw it as far as I can out the directly out the side of the boat, attach the planer boards to it, and then go from there. And you say you suspend under planer boards sometimes I too, suspend right? suspend under planer boards, yeah. How I, does that work? I, I've never heard of anybody doing that until well, I heard your little talk. When, a lot of times what I'll do is if I see a, a lot of trees that are in the area and I, I got the tops and you see suspended fish, you know, I'll see how far down those fish are running. And then I'll just, you know, I'll mark off if they're 20 feet down, I'll suspend the bait, put it on the clip 15 feet under the board and then just run it over top. You want it over top of them. Uh, that way they'll come up to it. Um, uh, if you get it down below, very seldom do they go down, you know, right. they come up. So, okay. Hey, Gary Ren Renfro, welcome to the channel. Sorry, I just messed up my words. Jason Lamb. Hey, D, I've seen you in here a bunch too. Sorry, I missed you earlier. Um, yeah, Chad's talking nice about me, my brother. Uh, <laughs> when, when did catfishing and, and you know, take it for what it's worth uh the 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 terms i'm using but when did catfishing go from a hobby to a sport um you know back when you were tournament days and everything like that when do you remember that change over coming um well i've been tournament fishing since uh 19 1988 mm -hmm. so that we were fishing my son and i were fishing tournaments in uh cincinnati ohio uh they were all flathead tournaments but 
you know, and, and it was big, you know, you had 40, 50 boats, uh, mm -hmm. payout wasn't that, you know, it wasn't nothing like it is now. And then, uh, then, uh, when Lynn and I got married in 94, uh, then we kind of got on the tournament scene and we were like the first husband and, uh, wife tournament anglers that was out there. And, um, uh, you know, w every other weekend we were on the water. So, you know, and that, you know, she had a couple of state records and she caught one of the biggest fish anybody would ever seen back in, uh, 07, you know, 88 pound blue cat. That's crazy. I can't wait to hook up to one like that. <laughs> it's, it's wild. That's for sure. So it became a way of life for you. Uh, yeah, we did it for 25 years. So like, do you remember what got you into tournament fishing? I know it's been a while, but like what, when did you decide, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to try this out and see how I like it. Cause I'm, I'm kind of at that point right now to where, um, I'm just getting really into catfish and I do it all the time now. Um, you know, I grew up, my father and I would go, uh, bluegill brim fishing and shellcracker fishing. And, yeah. and I just past couple of years, I just got into catfishing and, you know, loved it. And, uh, so I've, I've done one tournament, I've done two tournaments. One of them, I won. I don't know how I did that, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but anyway, like, do you remember like what clicked in your mind that, Hey, this is what I'm going to do. What made it a lifestyle for you, tournament fishing? Uh, you know, just Lynn just enjoyed the tournament scene. And, you know, she, she, <laughs> she picked out all of our boats that we own. Oh, and, really? <laughs> yeah, so she said, well, I want this boat. And then, then when we moved up to the pro cats, she wanted that boat. So, you know, it just, it was, that was our way of life. Just I loved it, you know. Every other weekend, I had to work every other weekend, or I think if if I didn't have to work every other weekend, I would have. We would have been on the water every weekend. So. And now you don't have to wait for the weekend. <laughs> and now, now I don't even. I try not to even fish the weekends. Yeah, I hear that. <laughs> I fish Monday through Friday, five days a week, weather permitting. Saturday yeah. and Sunday, you know, I don't fish on Saturday and Sunday because. You know, all the weekend warriors are out there and, you know, it's, I, I like it by myself out there. You know, it's enjoyable, you know, so, and, and I, through the week, you know, I'm always concentrating on, I'm right now I'm, I'm Matt. I'm okay. So I've lived in Alabama for three months. Um, I currently have from the dam clear down beyond Cox Island, which is about halfway um, I have got that from bank to bank totally mapped out. So, you know, on real calm, dead days, which there's not that many in Alabama, you know, rather than fish, I start mapping. You know, I just start doing crisscrossing back and forth that lake. And every, and, and what I do with my Lowrance, every piece of structure that I see that is noted gets a stop sign. The reason I put a stop sign on there is I know I can't drag through it and it's something that is noted that I need to stop and take a look at. So um, if you look at my mapping, it's got stop signs everywhere, mm -hmm. all over it. Fish, you know, if I catch a fish, you know, I, I drop a waypoint right there. It'll be a blue dot or a blue X. Uh, an, a, an X is a big fish. Uh, a blue dot is just, you know, a fish. But when I start catching them like that, you know, you do, they develop patterns and you'll see, you know, whether they're staying on the ledge or if they're up on a flat. So if I see a bunch of dots in a row, you know, and I'm, I'm out there actively catching fish and then it, 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 I quit catching fish. Then I just, you know, pull everything up, run right up above that and go either to the right or the left of that pattern that I had just established. Um, so, and so that's why my mapping is so important, right? Right, Chris Souter says, Have a wonderful night. Good night, Chris. Thanks for popping in. Um, Thanks, Chris. so, so when you're, I've always, I always forget to put a waypoint on my graph when I catch a fish because I'm so into catching the fish. Like, 
do you go back and do it when you're dragging or or do you stop and hit it while you're no. catching the fish? I've always wondered about yeah. that. The very first thing I do, if, if a fish lays down a rod, I reach over and I hit it. All you got to do is hit the waypoint two times real quick. That's all you got to do. And and Because I have a lower rants as well, so that should work yeah. the same. Plus, I got an, an LR1 on my chest, the remote that they have Lawrence has that LR one that you can do the waypoint right from there too. And a lot of times I'll reach down there and pop that one on. So it's a wireless thing that goes to the, you know, I, I have a Lawrence HDS 12 live unit. Wow. So. <laughs> yeah. I got the, uh, a triple seven, a, a hook. Yeah. Us, us uh, old men have to have a big screen so you can see things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll get there one day. I'll, I'll get me a big one. Uh, it's a, I think it's a split shot. Uh, low rent split shot, something oh, okay. I can't remember. Um, not a touch screen or anything, but I, I'll get one one day. The guy talked me out of it when I bought my boat. Uh, real good guy. I know him, but. I wanted like I wanted all that in that same payment, and he talked me into this one. He said, "This is all you'll need. This is all you'll need." So okay, you know, you sell boats for a living. You must know. Yeah, I, <laughs> I wish I would have just got what I wanted. <laughs> Can you remember how many tournaments you've won? Uh, I haven't really won that many. Uh, or how about placed in the top three? <laughs> oh yeah, a bunch of those. Yeah, I've come in. Uh, the uh, second place a ton of times and third a ton of times. Uh, I don't think I've ever won any majors, what they call major tournaments. Uh, you know, I've come close a, a few times. Uh, last year in the Mississippi River Monsters, I fished with uh, Quentin Robbins and uh, John Adams, and we came in eighth, and that's the best I've ever done. And, and we were only about – I think eight pounds out of first from first. So it was, it was tight. You know, one fish would have made the difference. Hmm. Uh, Betty Jean cross says, doc, what's the most important information you would give someone for their first experience on Wilson Lake? What is the most important information? So she's going to be down on Wilson here in October, I believe. Yeah. And so oh, I guess yeah. it's her first time on Wilson. Uh, just don't get overwhelmed when you get out there. Uh, you know, you, if you start dragging right off, uh, you're going to lose a lot of hardware, <laughs> you know, so it can get pretty frustrating and stuff like that. But if you look at your mapping and you, and you see those, uh, flats, generally the flats, which you don't have any ledges on the flats are just open big open areas on your mapping uh i really wish i i had you know i could show people what it looks like but it just looks like a big like a big bowl thing um you can drag in those areas a lot of people drift i enjoy i like vertical drifting uh people call it dead sticking i like doing that um it's it's pretty exciting just for the fact that uh, when a big fish hits, you got goes in the water, lights <laughs> in the water, and it's screaming. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about dead sticking. I just call it suspending baits. Um, I'm thinking about doing that tomorrow. I'm going out in the morning and uh, going on our river instead of the lake because I know the lake's going to be full of jet skis and wake boats. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I'm thinking about suspending because I, I love that that rod tip going straight down and a drag coming out. Uh, I'll, I'll have to decide on where I go. Tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I, I rarely ever hear anglers from your neck of the woods talk about bluegill uh, for, as their first bait. And uh, is it just not something that, that, that people uh, use a lot in Ohio, like bluegill for bait? Yeah, they, yeah, flathead fishermen use a lot of bluegill. Okay. I just never, I just never used them because I always use live shad. You know, I always had a bait tank. I've got an extreme bait tank right now, uh, but always before I always had a bait tank and I always used live shad. So I never, very seldom used bluegill because I would much rather use 
a live shad than I would a bluegill. Just something about a live shad down there uh, drumming that, that rod when it's, you know, if you're anchored down, he's just sitting there like that. And then all of a sudden it just, it gets real nervous and then it gets laid down. Mm -hmm. yeah, it just, you know, because, you know, my, my, mainly my background is uh, flatheads. So that's what I mainly chase. But here in Alabama, there's more, there's, there's a lot of flatheads, but there's more, there's 10 times as many blues than there is flatheads. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, same same down and down here. You know the the blues the blues uh, rule the world down here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Charlie Hubbard said only bait. I live in Ohio. Fished the Ohio River. Caught a fifty pound flathead on one. I guess he's talking about bluegill. Yeah. Yeah. I just, and I've heard some some uh, you know and it's from YouTube so take it for what it's worth. But uh, a lot of catfishing guys say like bluegill is like a beginner catfish bait like if you can't get the shad or the or the skipjack it's kind of like a, a, a easier access bait not i guess i agree with that yeah and, and, I, and I, you know uh i follow follow joe jellison uh mm -hmm. at fishing a lot and you know cut bluegill is one of his his main streams man i mean he catches some big fish on cut bluegill. he does you know, so, you know, and I don't know if it's that water, you know, why, but, you know, I've tried it here in Alabama when Willie Smith was here uh, last month, we tried cut bluegill and we, you know, we tried some live and, and cut and we couldn't get them to go on it. So, you know, well, they love it. They love it here on Santee. They, they love bluegill. Um, you know, they like, they like blue back herring too. That's pretty popular here. Um, but you know, we don't have skipjack and, and shad, uh, you know, it's just not as, it's not as big around here. Right. Um, but yeah, in, in the Cooper river, when I go, uh, I'll get frozen herring, you know, just cause I don't, you know, weekend warrior, you don't have enough time to go catch your bait. So yeah, I'll throw it out there and I won't get any hits, but I'll, I'll catch some bluegill and cut it up, put it out there and it'll slam down immediately. So I, I think it does maybe have something to do with your water. <laughs> that could be, I mean, you know, and the thing of it is, uh, shad down here is the forage bait fish. You know, there's, there's right now there's millions of shad in the water. The skipjacks are feeding on them. Uh, in fact, I saw a freshwater drum. We, we were getting those little one, two inch ones. I seen a freshwater drum come right up underneath of those guys and suck them down. Just wow. I'd never seen that before, but I seen them roll right up underneath. They were up at the dam, and they, you know, they, they just sucked them right down, just eating <laughs> them right off the surface of the water. Uh, let's see. I know you don't. Um, I haven't seen you bank fish a lot. Bank um, fish. Gary Gary Renfro says just getting into catfishing. Have to fish from the bank here in Georgia. Please, any info would be appreciated. What what advice can you give Gary? Um, you know, I don't I don't bank fish hardly at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time I'm the only time I'm bank fishing is I would go up to the dam at at Blow Wheeler Dam. They got a pavilion that, that's covered up, so if it's pouring down rain i'll go up there and uh sit underneath that that way i don't get wet and uh i'll fish from the bank there you know for the day you know especially if it's through the week you know i just i like to fish so i'll just throw some baits out there uh you know try try to keep the freshest bait that you can on your hook you know that's the only bad part about the the bank guys are very limited on what they can do now there's a lot of bank fishing uh on the lakes in alabama there's there's all kinds of bank fishing uh but it, you know i know in the ohio river it's kind of limited there's only for certain areas that you can yeah. go stuff like that it's not as it's not as limited in alabama as it is on the ohio i'd say gary the biggest asset um i've heard a lot of bank fishermen talk about is just getting that navionics app um because you can you can see the depths that you're fishing from the bank 
um, and you can see where to throw because, you know, I think it's kind of ironic that, uh, <laughs> you know, you you get you get boat fishermen that try to fish closer to the bank and the bank fishermen are trying to fish way out in the <laughs> in the uh, the canal. So, you know, getting that Navionics or Navionics, however you say it, brim or bluegill. Yeah, thanks, Mister Lyle. <laughs> I call I call everything a brim down here, except for a shell cracker. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, Gary, get that Navionics app. There's a free version, but the um, the app is only fourteen dollars uh, a year, um, and it'll I guarantee it has your river or your lake on it, and you can see the depths and and struck or uh, not structure, but um. Just the contour lines and yeah. where the drop offs are and everything like that. Yeah, so. and the tighter the lines are, that's where your ledge is. And, mm -hmm. and the fish use ledges as highways. That's right. Unfortunately, when you're sink when you're fishing from the bank and you throw across that ledge, you're almost always going to be hung up mm -hmm. because it's on the other side of the ledge. Mm -hmm. They're all talking Hopefully about a fish eats it before you have to bring it back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's a, there's a, there's a good many bank fishermen in here, Gary, uh, avid, uh, does a lot. I know catfish and crappy. He does some, um, and then, uh, chunky cats, if he's still in here, you know, so those guys can give you some, a lot of, uh, a lot of advice on that. Uh, do you use planter boards in choppy water? I yep. asked because yesterday we we had two and three foot swells of Moultrie, and um, you know we were fine because we uh you know I got a pontoon boat and it can handle it, but my planter boards kept disengaging when I'd go up and down, and then the planter board would come over the wave, and the pressure pulling from the wave would disengage it from the line, and I'm just wondering what you what well, you do when it goes like that. You know, most of the time I don't want to. Uh, you know, I use uh, offshore planer boards, and they've got mm -hmm. a pin on the back side that if you slide that line, it will not disengage from the board. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if a fish hits it and then the board stays right there, once you bring the board to the boat, then you can just open it up, allow it to slide down or remove the board. So you don't mind fighting that planer board in? Nah, no. <laughs> do you ever get fooled by it <laughs> you think you're bringing in a bigger fish than you actually are yeah because i i've had some of them that uh will take a head swipe at it and uh the hook will get them in the side of the you know in the back or in the tail and mm -hmm. you're sitting there fighting like crazy and uh, you think oh man this is a really good one and then you, you get real disappointed <laughs> when you see see them all of a sudden they come in and they're sideways or yeah or wrap all around their head and so hey showman blues thank you yeah I, I i know he's not in here but kayak catfish justin johnson one of my favorite youtubers he he gave us a shout out for the live show tonight he was live uh at seven so i got some people in here for the first time and thank you all for coming in thank you for giving us a chance and i hope you're uh getting a lot of information from doc we're trying to try to squeeze some more out as long as he'll stay on we'll keep going uh hey who's your catfish excursion he says i catch a lot of blue get blues on live gills here in indy that was a tongue twister you can order replacement clips yeah yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I think that's what one over outdoors did with his planer board. He was having the same problem. Um, who do you look up to as an angler? Someone who's, you know, well known in the catfish industry. You've been around for a while and, you know, we often forget that, you know, you learn from somebody and maybe you have someone you look up to or my looked main, up to. My mentor was James Patterson. He was at years ago. He was a guide on the Mississippi River. Now, you know, now he's retired. Um, he fishes a lot with Quentin, but w we've been friends for a lot of years. And uh, uh, I, you know, I've known him a long time. But he he taught me how to fish. You know, and he he spanked me in so many tournaments that wasn't funny. <laughs> and uh, we we still bring that kind of stuff up. You know, so it's we when we get together, we 
relive a lot of old memories. So mm. yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, but yeah, he's, he's a good friend of mine. And, uh, but that's who really taught me how to, how to fish for fish in current. So, you know, I'm, I'm mainly a river fisherman. Uh, right. You know, I'm, I'm now I'm in Alabama. So the rivers become kind of lakes down here and, you know, cause they're so big and so huge, but it's still a river. And, you know, I, I just, I can't, I'm really excited for the fall to get here. So me too. Me too. Get, <laughs> so I can get some current. If I can get a hundred thousand coming off of, off of that dam and I can be halfway down the river and I can be anchored up and throwing baits into the trees. That, that is my go-to right there. I, I love fishing like that, but I like <laughs> fishing in heavy current. So awesome. I hey, hate Jay's cat fishing. Taught me, you know, how to yeah. fish in a heavy current. That's awesome. Um, I mean, I always wonder, like the people who I look up to and I, I watch and get information from, I always wonder who their mentors were because, you know, you just, it, it compounds, you know, because you, you get that information and then you develop your own techniques and then that information becomes one thing and then it just compounds. I, I don't know. I just think it's amazing how that happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that's for everything, not just fishing, but, um, you know, yeah, something that you there are enjoy. Ways of uh, fishing, anchor fishing is with a planer board. And a lot of people don't use planer boards when they're in a high current situation. Um, you know, if you run four rods out the back of the boat, and what will happen is they'll all kind of in the high current, it'll they'll all kind of get tangled together. Well, what I like to do is on those two outside rods is drop a planer board on there you know once a bait hits the bottom just put a planer board on there and that forces that line to stay outside all the time so yeah i just actually asked um uh lyle um you know lyle, um catfish weekly for everybody else uh you know i asked that on on his show um and, and he does the same thing uses those planter boards in high current and i i'd always thought about it but i had never done it so yeah. i might be trying that too we were on the Mississippi river and we were anchored up fishing and uh, it was in the heat of the day. Oh, it was, it was miserable out there. And we're sitting there, you know, we got tired of bumping. We wasn't catching the fish. We wanted, okay, let's anchor up. So we anchored up and then we put planter boards. We ran two straight out the back and then a planter board on each side. And the sun had been getting to us and I'm sitting there looking at this one planter board and all of a sudden it just disappears. It's gone. And I stand up and Wild goes, what are you doing? I said, that planer board, I don't know where it went. And <laughs> it went underwater. Put two and two together and a fish had already hit it and took off with it. So it wasn't until the rod loaded up that I I didn't even, you know, know. But, you know, I, I love the planer boards when there's high current like that. You know, it keeps those. So we got a few right. people asking what a planer board is. And since I got Doc Lang in here. I'm going to let you explain what a planter board is. Okay, so what a planter board does, it moves the line and your bait to the outside. of You have a right and a left planer board. Uh, so uh, it moves the line depending on how far you out that you want that board. It'll move your line out that far. So I generally look at 50 feet off of the boat. Sometimes if I'm running two or three boards on a side, I'll run one board probably 175 feet out and then oh, wow, that far, another, huh? 100 feet. Yeah. Yeah. One of the guys that was fishing with me, he goes, man, I'm going to have to have a set of binoculars to see that <laughs> last board out there. And yeah, I, I fish with guys that have run them way out farther than what I do, you know? And so, so basically it's a, it's a board. Um, yeah, it's got a cut. And it's a got a, it's got a slit. It. It's got a one side that makes it uh, cut through the water some more, and it's got a float on top. And because you know, I think I've seen them uh, pool noodles. I've seen styrofoam, and I've seen balsa wood. <laughs> um, they're all kinds of different. Everybody makes. Mm -hmm. you know, they're they're all over everywhere. There's all kinds of boards, but uh, and they can be made out of plexiglass too, right? Match fish and metal. 
What the- I'm sorry. I, I talked over you. I apologize. Um, I said they could be made out of plexiglass. Um, and some, uh, I've seen some made out of aluminum. Aluminum. Uh, I've seen them. Some mm-hmm. of them made out of plastic, uh, Lexan, mm-hmm. all that. But, you know, they got a clip on them that uh, yep. depending on how far you put the line into the clip, it'll mm-hmm. release it. And then uh, you got another clip that's on the back of the board. So the board stays with the clip. If you forget to put it on there, you're going to have to turn everything around and go <laughs> yeah. going the other way. Yeah. And then some of them, um, you know, when that clip, uh, like you said, some of them have it to where it, would, it won't disengage. But um, most of them, when you put that front clip on, so there's a back clip and a front clip. The back clip keeps it on your line so you don't lose it. So you don't um, have to the front. That's right. And the front clip, when it when there's a – like a, a fish hitting it or when you jerk the rod it'll jerk the front line out and the planer board will slide yeah. yeah it'll slide down the line yeah. um everybody's saying that i hit 900 subs uh, well thank you <laughs> thank you y'all um i can't remember i think i think i was at uh 870 something when we started but that, that's awesome thank you everybody doc brought them in <laughs> um and i want to thank kayak catfish again but yeah, so planter boards. Uh, hey, how you doing back there? Good. Is that one of your grandchildren? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of your kids. Oh, brand. Awesome, mind. awesome. Um, let's see. Um, what size planter boards do you run? And that that's actually a really great question. Um, the I run the mid size, uh, the OR twelves. And then we've got the OR16, which is a great big board. It's probably about 20, 22 feet, 22 inches long. Wow. Uh, it's a big board. It's thick board. Uh, they got flags on them. So in choppy water, you can see them. So um, do you change hip jacks? I run a little mini planer board. Yeah, the crappy ones, right? The crappy ones, yeah. <laughs> um, do you change techniques with the seasons or do you basically stick with the same thing? I pretty much stick to the same thing. Um, That's what I you know, when the water starts getting colder, I'll start anchoring more uh, or su- start suspending. I'll probably start less dragging uh, because the fish have a tendency of getting a little lethargic. They don't want to chase a bait. So mm-hmm. they would rather much rather you know, get that scent coming to them. Okay, I'll move up on this thing and see what's going on with it. Yeah. Hey, Jay's catfishing, and uh, those that hadn't said hey to, I'm just trying to get through these questions uh, before Doc has to go, so bear with me. Um, you said something, um, and I saw this at the – somebody filmed the catfish conference. Maybe it was them, and you, you, did, a, you did a seminar, and you talked about – dragging speeds and what i found really interesting is you said during the summertime when their metabolism is high you'll pull faster yes yeah so How fast do you go uh last week i was catching fish going a mile and a half wow really uh, yeah but the water temperature was 92 degrees yeah so you know i didn't want them little guys to just chew my baits up so I, I just start stepping it up. That also allows me to That's cover a, great, a, lot, a lot of ground in a very short period of time. So, uh, you know, it, it's just, you know, the colder the water, the slower I'll go. But when the water gets warm, you know, I've had, you know, on the Mississippi River, when you're fishing down there, uh, you know, that current's going uh, six, seven mile an hour. And we're trying to cut it in a half to fish. So that's three and a half mile an hour. And they're running the baits down. So yeah. I guess that answers the question from Skip. Do you drag, drag up current or down current? I mainly I mainly drag going up current. You know, I'll, buy, I'll buy back bounce going down current, like on the Mississippi, but mm-hmm. on, on Wheeler and all that. And, and a lot of it depends on the where the wind is coming from. Very you know, true. I always drag into the wind. That way it always gives me the boat control that I want. Mm-hmm. And I do the opposite because I can't control where the wind blows my pontoon. <laughs> oh, so you just let it go. <laughs> yeah, and I use drift socks and I try to slow down as much as I can. 
um, I actually, I actually um, drift backwards on my pontoon boat, and I'm going to do a video about that. I've had some requests. Um, I use drift socks and a and a uh, trolling motor to yeah. control my drift going backwards. So uh, that's going to come soon. Uh, Michael Marillo, do your grandkids know how their grandpa is beloved by the catfish community? Yeah, I kind of got a feeling they do. A lot of people <laughs> say stuff to them. So, you know, I, I'm real blessed with that. You know, a lot of, you know, I, I just enjoy fishing and I enjoy sharing a lot of information. I've always been that way. You know, I had that had a hook from catfish website for over 21 years. Mm -hmm. And well, you've uh, been, you shared it on catfish weekly for how long? Yeah. For, uh, well, I was on catfish weekly for almost two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one of the reasons I left is I knew I was, I was going to Alabama and I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to fish, you know, so I don't want to come off of the water to try to do a show. Lyle understood. Yeah. He didn't have a problem. Oh yeah. So, yeah, I know he. I know he misses you, and we all miss you on there. But uh, you know, he's doing a great job, and and James. Yeah, is him and James are doing awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I, I I'm happy for him. I'm glad that. Yeah. But I a lot of times I'm sitting out there, I'm fishing, and I'm sitting there listening to Catfish Weekly while I'm That's right. So you know, I I'm, I just you know I I and I'll get on there on my phone and type in, yeah, I'm out here fishing while you're <laughs> sitting there talking. Yeah. On, so Line. those of you who don't know what Doc's talking about, um, there's a talk show just like, uh, well, similar to this, live on Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 Central. Um, so go check it out. I'm sure Fishing with the Chad will put the link up there. It's called Catfish Weekly. Doc used to be co-host with Lyle Stokes on there, and um, he's retired from since retired from the show, and yep. uh, he's out on the water a lot more. Yeah, now my That's job is five days a week is catch, trying to catch fish. That's right. And right well, now, well, keeping yeah. up with grandkids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Last question for the night, Doc. And, um, you know, this might, might, you might have to think for a second. What's the hardest lesson you've had to learn from fishing? The hardest lesson. And, and I, while you're thinking about it, I, the reason I ask you is, um, you know, there's some, sometimes when you get all the advice in the world from parents or friends or YouTube or whatever, and you just don't listen to it because you think you know better. And then something slaps you in the face when you're on the water and you learn that lesson the hard way. Uh, I think Flint Hill has had a great experience. He had a sh video that came out where his anchor uh, got caught up and he almost flipped the whole kayak over. Thankfully he jumped out, but oh, wow. what about you? Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are, uh, how long you've been doing this kind of stuff. You can always learn from somebody else. Be willing to, you know, try to learn as much as you can because we're only on this world for so long and Amen. nothing is guaranteed. And, uh, you know, I, I live my life, my day, my life as if tomorrow I'm not going to be here. So in the meantime, I'm having a good time. I praise God when I get that opportunity because, you know, it's, it's all about him. You know, he, he, he's allowing me to do this you know this was Amen. the thing that lynn and i had had uh, talked about for years you know when i retired we were going to go move south and fish on the water until our lives ended and uh he he needed another angel so uh you know so i'm 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 down here just flying solo, and she, I know she's sitting there watching me all the time because, I, you know, I, I can feel it, you know, so. Amen, man. <laughs> Almost brought me to tears there. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Doc, I, I want to thank you so much. Um, you know, it means a lot to me that you would take time out, especially when you're with family. Um, like you just said, the most important thing yeah. other than God Uh is your family and you took time out and you got grandkids back there that you came to see specifically. And man, it means the world to me. I appreciate that. I thanks for letting me be on the show. You know, uh, I was on catfish weekly a couple of weeks ago and we had all kinds of 
internet issues just mm -hmm. because I live so far out in the country, yeah. you know, but I was here at my daughter-in-law's and I knew, Oh boy, you know, we can do this. <laughs> so, and, and Lyle said, there's always a spot on catfish weekly doc old buddy. Yeah. So <laughs> I think the next time I'm on there, I'll, I'll just do it from the boat. That way I know. There I, you go. <laughs> I can, I can so. There you go. Well, doc, I'm going to pray for us. All right. Heavenly Father, I, I just thank you for this night. I thank you for all the people that came in, Lord, and gave their time. And I thank you for Doc uh, and his family and his wealth of knowledge, Lord. I just thank you for people like Doc that are willing to share all that they know about fishing and life. Uh, not just fishing, but just like he said, Lord, uh, putting you first and, and keeping the family second. And then for him, fishing. Uh, Lord, and I just thank you for his passion for the sport. I thank you for his love for you. And I thank you for the ministry that he's uh, giving through the sport of fishing. Lord, as always, I thank you for this channel, uh, for a way for me to uh, have a small part in your kingdom, Lord, pushing uh, the ministry uh, of Jesus Christ. And I just thank you for that. And I thank you for this country that we live in, that we can do these sort of things. Uh, and Lord, I just pray for Doc that his health would continue to be excellent, though, that he would continue to be able to fish Monday through Friday, uh, you know, weather permitting. And Lord, I just praise you for him and I just praise you for his health. And and Lord, for everyone in here, I'm thankful for all of them. And I give you all the praise, honor, glory for us in Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. Thanks for coming in. Y'all, if you if you, if you would, please hit the thumbs up button. If you've been thinking about subscribing, go ahead and, and do that for all of you who came in uh, tonight for the first time. Welcome. I hope you like what you see. And if you don't, I understand. But uh, thank you, Justin Johnston, uh, for sending in my way. Next weekend is Anna's 40th birthday, y'all. She's going to be super old. And uh, <laughs> as uh, one of going to be smacking you upside the head. <laughs> No, she won't. Uh, that's my smoking hot wife. She knows uh, that. But uh, but hey, we're going to be doing a live cooking show. A lot of people said they like that. So um, we're going to be cooking a low country boil with crabs added in. So you don't you're not going to want to miss that. If if you've never had a low country boil, it's delicious. You ever had one, Doc? No. Oh, man. Well, you're in Alabama, man. You got to go down. You just... I'm going to have to come to your place. I'm just going yeah, to man. in the truck and drive to your place. You're always welcome. All right, everybody. Thank you right, again. Thank Doc. you. God bless you. Happy fishing, everyone.